Greetings everyone, this is Shamini Chan, founder and CEO of the Consciousness and Healing Initiative. And I am so pleased to be sitting here with our scientists and healers. We've been conducting a research study on a process called biofield tuning um, that was developed by healer Eileen McCusick, who is sitting to my right, and some of you may have seen an initial video that Eileen and Richard, our research director for the Consciousness and Healing Initiative did, when we were exploring the healer-scientist partnership in research, and um, we have had an incredible couple of days conducting our IRB-approved funded research study with biofield tuning, and I thought it would be really helpful for our community uh, to share with you guys what we've learned through the process, because it's really been incredible. Um, so first off, Richard, I mean, what are your thoughts about what we've done so far? We've tried to step back and, and do some of the very first steps that you want to do in testing any kind of healthcare intervention, and that is to ask if several practitioners come up with the same assessment. And with biofield tuning, that's one thing I've learned from the practitioners is that because it's not a medical practice, we don't use the term diagnosis, we use the term assessment. So what I asked was if uh, Eileen could come and bring two of her um, top practitioners with her, and we would line up 10 people, 10 volunteers who they had not seen before or treated before, would all three um, come up with similar assessments and what in this case assessment means is um, the sites at which the sound of the tuning fork appears to change what in some cases they call perturbations where are the perturbations so when they strike the tuning fork and comb the field out from a specific site on the body where are those sites that they detect a change in that frequency of the sound, and in terms of their own clinical practice, which we're not studying in this particular research test, um, to what extent um, are they agreeing on the position? And so we're, we're putting metal um, tape measures on the floor so they can read out um, inches. Uh, for each of the sites. So what we'll talk about later after we hear from them is um, as much as we try to have a research study reflect clinical practice, because there's no point in just having a research study that's, that's rigid and doesn't really bend and uh, capture what they're doing in clinical practice, it's difficult because we have certain constraints in research and it's been an amazing learning experience both for me as a researcher from, to learn from the practitioners and as came up in our discussion um, each day after the number of volunteers that we've tested, um, it's worked both ways. So the practitioners have learned more about research and we've learned more about practice of biofield tuning. So just to summarize, Richard, um, essentially what we've done, right, is to look at what we might call inter-rater reliability, right? Which is, if you have three biofield tuning practitioners, and I mean, it might be worth it for us to review again what biofield tuning is about for those who are unfamiliar and might have not seen our previous video. Um, we're basically asking the question, if these three healers are saying they sense shifts in the field, that you know are related to a person's state of consciousness, let's just say that. Do they reliably all detect the same perturbations in the same places? It's, an, it's a simple inter-rater reliability study. But what appears to be a simple study is in fact not so simple. And uh, yeah, so I think mean, maybe you can explain just you know pretty you know succinctly if you don't mind, like what is biofield tuning anyway? Sure, biofield tuning is based on the hypothesis that I've come up with based on my research that our memories are stored in our own kind of personal cloud around our body and that they're stored vibrationally, that they're vibrationally encoded in standing waves. 
And I've developed a method where we uh, use a tuning fork like a needle on an album and, and start at the outer edge of the field, which we perceive to be somewhere around five to six feet off the side of the body. Uh, it's like dropping a needle on an album. And as the vibrating tuning fork moves through the field, it interacts with the information in the standing waves. And over the years, I came to see that very specific memories seem to live in very specific areas around the body. And that if somebody had had a very traumatic experience, that the, the waveform perturbations that the tuning fork would reveal, kind of like an in, uh, invisible ink decoder almost. Right. You know, we find these areas of perturbation in people's fields that um, are there, they're invisible. And I think we sense, you know, when somebody's perturbed, you know, like we can <laughs> feel all their vibes. And so these are, you know, but very specific memories. And so the tuning fork is very cool because it will allow us to locate these areas by initially resonating with whatever disturbance is present. So specific emotions have specific, you know, sounds that they make, um, things like anxiety, alarm, fear, you know, they're detectable. It's like a language that we, we learn. So, so, you know, in my years of practice as this sort of pattern that I call the biofield anatomy revealed itself and I was finding that I was finding stuff in the field that I could move and I was finding, um, you know, this very distinct age pattern as well. Mm -hmm. um, I, I brought up the question, you know, is this really going on? Like, am I imagining this? Is this really here? Is this really happening? Right. And, uh, and you know, started to teach it to people and they could do it and they could use the map and they could learn to identify things. So you actually developed a map based on your years of experience and then you've taught other practitioners to use this map. And so for, for you, Jillian, and for you, Angela, you know, as you've started to work with this map, I mean, have you really noticed that, you know, concordance? In other words, you know, what um, Eileen is picking up is in, indeed what you're picking up when you're using the tuning forks. Yeah, Absolutely. definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Through like, you know, I see about four clients a week right now, but I used to see a lot more and just, I've been practicing for about four years. And over the years I've seen that, um, you know, would pick up things in people's timeline and their field, you know, mention where it is on the map and the age. And I'd say roughly 90% of the time it resonates with the person on the table. I mean, are they surprised? Because you're big, they're not talking, right? And you're just kind of moving the two. They're super and impressed. You're like, at this age, <laughs> blah, you know, it seems like something happened here at this age because I'm feeling this disturbance in the field that's associated with this around this age. And, and what happens? What do they say? I mean, they're just... They're impressed. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Like, wow, I can't How believe you, you know picked that, that up. <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. So as scientists, we were kind of intrigued by this, right? Because it's, you know, they're saying that they have this, at the very least, we can say some kind of a mind map, right? Some kind of a framework for understanding, you know, this energy around the body, which many healers talk about, right? The biofield, and this is one aspect of the biofield that has information, and you've developed a systematic process for trying to decode that information. So the inter-rater reliability study was just the tip of the iceberg here for the research that we're going to do. Um, and the first step is just to figure out, do you three all feel the same things, right? At the same places. Yeah. So you said intrigued, you know, you're intrigued by, I'm, I'm way more than intrigued. <laughs> I think this is um, an amazing uh, process that can expand the, the present way we think of physiology and the present biomedical model, that there is actually information about our health history, about our physical and emotional history that's stored outside of the body in ways that, that is accessible and interpretable that, that these old uh, micro traumas, major traumas are still resonating and still affect us and even after all these years not only can they be detected but they can be smoothed out or rebalanced or whatever the term we're, we're looking for these new these new terms for for what you do so uh, I that's my main driving interest in this uh, practice is that it has amazing implications for um, how we view um, health and especially healing. Yeah, absolutely. And, and then that's why the research has to be done because these are pretty grand claims, right? And so we developed this really simple research study, right? What we thought was pretty simple. And just to let you guys know what we actually did, um, 
about a year or a little bit more than that, um, we did an initial pre-pilot, and that was just to test the protocol. So the protocol means, you know, essentially how we conducted the study. And the way that we decided to conduct the study was first by getting together as scientists and healers and understanding more about Eileen's work and then developing what we thought was a sensible way to look at this. And so we kind of co-developed it together, right? And I mean, would you like to talk about what that process was like, Eileen? Because, you know, it took some time. Right? Yeah, it took two years. It took two years. You know, people are always saying to me, where's the research? You know, what's the research? Like, we have no idea, like, how long research takes. And it takes money. And, you know, we had to coordinate five people who travel internationally all the time to get together and make this happen. And, ref you know, re create the protocol, test the protocol, refine the protocol, get back together, you know, then come up with a final protocol. And then that had to go through an IRB. You know, it's just, it's taken a lot of time for this to come together. It's no small deal to do research. And, um, and but that said, I'm so glad that we've put the time and the effort in because we learned so much. And I think one of the big things that came to us even on day one was we don't even really care what the numbers are because we've, we've learned so much just by putting all of our heads together and making observations. And they've been, we've made some really surprising observations and uh, and it's been it's been fascinating, and I think ultimately, and you know, however the numbers line up or don't line up, it's given us a lot of food for thought and a lot of stuff to work with going forward. And I feel like we're you know, like Richard said, we're kind of opening up this whole new field of the biofield. Yeah. And you know, I feel like I've just been kind of poking around the dark with some tune forks, but I think that there is room for you know so to shine so much more light on what's going on in the field and how making simple adjustments in the field fixes the body. We look at the field as the blueprint and we want to we want to fix things in the blueprint and the body refers to the blueprint and mm -hmm. follows that as it recreates itself. Mm -hmm. So talk a little about for instance what we all love the realization that, that there is something going on that we could call biofield drag or photon, photon drag. drag. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, so this, is, this is a very big kind of aha for us. Um, because, you know, a lot of times when, when people first start learning about this, they say things like, uh, well, how do you know the, t the changes in tone are room acoustics or uh, the way you're holding the fork? And the answer is, well, well, it's both. You know, the, the, the quality of the strike, the room acoustics, the way you're holding the fork, that's all going to affect the tone. But I always say, but there's another signal present, and, that it, and you have to kind of dig around and listen for that signal. And when you find them, and they're very distinct, and you can really hear anxiety in the overtones, or you you can hear the undertone of depression. Um, but what we discovered in this time was that there's actually a third signal, an anomalous signal. And that is uh, the process of moving the fork through the ambient field seems to scrunch up the field. Like if you had a throw rug on the floor and you, you pushed it with the heel of your hand, it would kind of accordion. And, and then it would reach a place where it wouldn't really go any further. It would stop. And so there's this sense of the fork going through the field and bunching up the, the bioplasma that's present to, to enough density that it creates the illusion of resistance of finding a stuck spot in the field. And I, that's probably something I would need to repeat again and again for people to get. But essentially you have the, med the bioplasmic medium of the field and the fork acting like a magnet moving through it. And, and we found that there's about a 10 inch, if you go about 10 inches, that you amass enough charge in front of the fork where it feels like you've hit an area of of stickiness in the field, mm -hmm. but it's an artifact. It's an artifact. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what. So, what one way I like to think about it is to use um, Donald Rumsfeld's terms that when you do a research study like biofilm tuning, there's no knowns. So, so the known knowns are variables that we know how to build into the protocol like there are supposed to be, um, there are very strong reports from all the practitioners that there are perturbations at some place along. So we know that's a known known. Okay, but the unknown knowns are what Eileen said before about what's going on in the room. Now the practitioners um, every morning uh, that we started, this was a three day study, they clear the room. Well, I, you know, I've heard that concept over. I don't know what it is that collects in the room. I don't know how they clear it, but 
what happens in that room, the ambient energy in that room, for lack of a better term, is a, is a known unknown, meaning we know it's a problem and we don't know how to, uh, how to deal with it. And this, this new uh, possibility that, uh, that the way the perturbations are detected involves a kind of sweeping that causes a buildup of something which is a non-specific effect which can interfere with the practitioners detecting the specific changes which they call the perturbation. So that's another known unknown. Yeah. <laughs> and then we, we also had, uh, maybe Jillian, you want to speak about this? our experience of um, our, when we first started practicing, right? We were going in like robots and how we had a completely different experience with that. Right, yeah, I mean, as practicing the protocol. Yeah, yeah. The protocol. as practitioners, you know, we are, we're engaging with the client and, um, and kind of looking for a story or, or being curious about their story. And with research, our, our mindset was a little bit different. Well, it was a lot different. Um, we were going to the research, well, let's just see if we can find these perturbations. And um, we were noticing that they weren't, the perturbations that we normally find in a regular like clinical session were not, um, they're usually a lot stronger. So the perturbations that we were finding in research were a lot more subtle. And uh, it was kind of throwing all of us off and we weren't really talking about it until the end of practice one day. And we, we each said, hey, this is what's going on. And, each practitioner was like, oh, me too, me too. So it was kind of relieving <laughs> that we were all sort of experiencing it, but it was really uh, really interesting. So, um, yeah, I mean, what I find really interesting about that, Jillian, is first of all, I think it's really resonant with a lot of research in integrative medicine where we're doing our best to kind of capture what's happening in clinical practice, right? But just by nature of doing a research study, it's different. And so the, the mental mindset and the intention is different in that session and I think you, I mean you explain this beautifully it's different when you're doing a clinical session where you're going in completely clinically and you're, you do treatment I mean you guys don't just do assessment in a session you do assessment and treatment you know during the same session right so you're going in with a completely different mind frame intention you know everything when you're in a clinical session and in this case it was almost like Correct me if I'm wrong, but if it wasn't necessarily anxiety, it was at least just sort of a kind of very hyper-focused, you know, this is the goal, mm -hmm. right? So your mental frame is completely different in this situation. Different. And it really speaks to how difficult it is to do realistic research with any healing modality because, you know, and we've had lots of discussions in the integrated medicine field about the right ways to do acupuncture research or, you know, Ayurveda research or any of these things because just by the nature of doing research, it's different from clinical practice. It just is. I mean, unless you're just following the clinical practice as it is, when we're doing these kinds of things like inner rate of reliability and we're asking you guys to detect, you know, where you're hearing a shift in sound or feeling a shift in the energy, that's just different from clinical practice, right? right? Another another known unknown, which is very important for this study, is to what extent does the first practitioner uh, combing the field affect the field so that it's changing what the second and third practitioner are going to find and what they're going to report? And that's a known unknown, right? In other that's words, we, and it's a supposed known unknown because we don't even, you know, so there's a lot of these known unknowns. And, and yeah. Richard, I think there are some yeah. of our scientific colleagues that will be like, what are they talking about, okay? You don't even know that this is an unknown. So it's very messy, right? Because we have all these yeah. hypotheses, but they don't just come out of nowhere. This is coming out of clinical experience from the healers. Yes. You know, so it's not yes. just something we're making up, but it's actually something that's coming from your experience that we are trying to understand and put in a research, yeah. you know, box. And you mentioned acupuncture research. It's a very similar problem when you're trying to do pulse diagnosis in Chinese medicine, which is such an important part of their uh, clinical assessment, that when you're trying to teach students um, with, a, with a, a real patient, that by the time the second or third or fourth student is feeling the same pulses, they're different. Because in a way, um, just by... Uh, detecting the perturbations or detecting the pulse, it's not pure diagnosis, if you pardon me using that word, it's not pure assessment, it's, it's diagnosis and treatment are 
um, inextricably part of the same process. So although you then pause and take a deep breath and then learn how to rebalance, but just by measuring, you're, you're changing what's there. So it's a kind of yeah. uncertainty, um, which is part of clinical practice. And it's fine when you're doing one, it's you with one client, but when, for, for this sake, when we're doing three of you sequentially testing the same thing on the same client, then it's another potential variable and a source of error. I started to wonder about that because uh, we did we randomized the selection of practitioners in the order that we went in, and um, I was randomly selected to be last. Um, I don't know, probably like six times, and I noticed that a lot of those times, uh, you know, we're supposed to be finding. Um, at least maybe five um, perturbations in the field. And I was noticing I was finding a lot less, less being last. Um, so that was a thought that came up for me. It's interesting. You know, we're not trying to modulate it, but we are using sound and we know the healing power of sound. Um, so it's also not surprising either. I mean, I have learned so much from this process and talking with all three of you, you know, about what your experience has even been going through this. I mean, I think it's generated new questions for research and also ways to refine the protocol. I mean, we worked on this protocol for a long time, we've developed this, and yet even going through it, we realized um, there are all these other nuances to kind of take into consideration. This research is, is difficult to do. And so some people might beg the question of why do it at all? You know, I mean, you know, and then I, I'm sure you guys get this too. I get people that say, well, well, those who believe in the healing approaches and the biofield approaches, you know, there are some that say, what do we need research for? And um, you know what? I mean, I would actually, and I would like the practitioners, Angela, Jillian, um, why we do yeah. research? Oh, because I'm curious. That's the only reason why I do it. I'm just curious. You know, I kind of stumbled into this weird thing and something that I did for 15 years and it was like, took me 15 years to get over thinking that it was weird. Um, and, you know, we're making a really big claim. I've been doing it for 22 years now. So for the last seven years, it's seemed kind of normal. But, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, <clears throat> we're making the claim, the, uh, we're making the observation, really, that um, rather than the mind being inside the body, that the body is actually inside the mind. And you know, that's a completely upside down observation from what the popular notion that everybody believes is. And so I think, you know, if you're gonna go and say that something, I, hey, I'm seeing something that's complete opposite of what everybody else is believing, um, it's worthy of investigation and trying to understand, you know, what's going on. Or, because uh, certainly, you know, we've trained over a thousand, we've trained like 1,200 people worldwide at this point, and everybody's able to find the perturbations. You know, they go home, they work with their map, they amaze their clients with their ability to pinpoint these things in the map. And so, you know, are these things really there? Or did, is this something that I just made up somehow? And it's, and I have a lot of charisma, and I've convinced everyone that it's true very successfully, and now they're just finding something, but there's really nothing there. You know, I don't. We don't really know. It could really anything could be could be going on here. So I, I'm I, I, I'm not doing the research to prove the hypothesis. I'm doing the research to investigate the hypothesis um, because I, I still have some skepticism about it and what's really happening. You know, um, I mean, we made some really interesting observations. One of them was just that that when we were approaching like machines we didn't get the volume changes we didn't get the texture we didn't get the richness of the signal that we get when we are in a clinic um, we also had one volunteer who um, had, had prior exposure to this work and knew kind of what was going on and we got a much more detailed all three of us got a much more detailed signal from her because she was even though she's wearing an eye pillow you know she's conscious engaging in the process and so we got much more information so you know it's clearly a meeting of the minds and and what we're thinking and what we're looking for and what we're intending is influencing the signal that we're getting yeah and so that's we, pretty amazing I don't know we've talked I mean we talk about that a lot of healers talk about the you know the role and the power of intention in the healing process mm -hmm. right so there's that so you know how much of that is sort of the mind filter you know um, that kind of dictates you know what information you're actually getting because yeah. you're setting your mind and your intention to gather a certain you know net 
you're, you're setting a, a net to sort of you know pick up certain information and filter out other information. Yeah, right. yeah another of my favorite known unknowns is what happens between the practitioner and, and the client. It's like in any kind of treatment that you go for, there's something about why you choose a particular practitioner to, to work on you. What, what's the vibe that you pick up? And part of that is going to be someday we're going to understand that, that the biofield of the practitioner is interacting with the biofield of the client, mm-hmm. not, which not only affects your um, comfort level of being with that practitioner, but it's going to affect the outcome of the results that you get. Right. So, so it's a whole other uh, goal of integrative medicine. Um, what, you know, what personalized medicine, all these new terms we're looking at, what the VA is now calling whole health, is really understanding what's happening between the patient and the practitioner um, in terms of the healing process. So, Angela and Jillian, I think kind of stated her feelings about research and why we do it. Now, this was this has been correct me if I'm wrong. Was this your first time kind of engaging in research? Yeah, as yeah. healing practitioners. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. So, would you do it again? Absolutely. <laughs> why? <laughs> <laughs> Well, like Eileen said, out of curiosity, um, it's and it's been really fun and interesting um, to make all these different kinds of discoveries. That, and it's been re- really inspiring for me. Like I'm just envisioning kind of how I'm going to be conducting my sessions from this point forward, and I imagine it being um, really different now. Really, just having kind of all this varied information that we've gathered from this research experience. Um, and how that might influence my sessions now from this point forward. Oh, how interesting. Yeah, That's so I'm, I'm excited about that. Yeah. Great. Well, and your, likewise, your clinical feedback to us has definitely helped us consider how we would design research studies in the future. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. What about you, Jillian? Um, it's really exciting to just be in the forefront, um, you know, of, of all this research in the biofield world because um, it's so new and, yeah, it's... You know, I loved. I love not having any expectations for the research, and just coming in with curiosity, and just from a place of discovery. And that, to me, is where I want to be spending a lot of my time. <laughs> right? It feels so much better and more freeing <laughs> to yeah. be in that state. I of just mind. want to add yeah. when when um, Eileen first came to Chi, and I knew hardly anything about biofield tuning, so I went and read her book. And there's a whole first section on, um, well, there's one section on the the history of energy medicine and sound healing. And then there's a whole another section on clinical, her clinical experience. So both of those were um, enlightening for me. But what I really loved was her statement, very clear statement in the book, that it was time for research. Mm -hmm. That she felt she had, was learning as much as she could um, out of her clinical practice, and now there were certain questions that had to be um, put through to, through the lens of of research, and so I'm just delighted as how much I'm learning uh, from them as practitioners, and also, as I said, my real interest is understanding how the concept of the biofield and the reality of the biofield is going to change and expand our understanding of human and health and medicine. I mean, let's yes. let's be honest. We're being very um, unattached and humble right now about the implications of this work. Should this type of research and more studies in the field of biofield science actually bear weight? Okay, but if we actually find something, then you know we're not only giving credence to a hypothesis, but we're opening the door potentially for new technologies, new um, developments to essentially capture a state of disharmony and correct that before we encounter disease. And let's be honest, we have a huge disease problem in the world. Right. You know, we're spending trillions of dollars on chronic health diseases that could completely be prevented. Absolutely. Um, And these kinds of biofield approaches can do so much to help us kind of detect those imbalances before they start and work with them, right, before they get in the physical body. So the impact of this work could be tremendous. But yet I have to say I've been so touched by 
the open curiosity and non-attachment of this group to the outcomes. And just to let you guys know, I mean, just a little bit of how the research protocol went, um, everyone's kind of hinted at the protocol. Each one of these folks were randomly, you know, came in to work with a patient and assess the perturbations, and they didn't talk to each other at all during that process, and they were randomly assigned, you know, order counterbalanced, all of that stuff, and took the perturbations. We simply wrote down the numbers that were associated with the distance um, between where they felt the perturbation and the person on the table. That data is now being entered into a spreadsheet and sent to a completely different person on the research team that is not here, um, who is an expert statistician who will do um, statistical analysis using the Monte Carlo method to determine whether indeed we have inner rate of reliability. So, you know, it's really, you know, following the protocol in the appropriate way. You know, I have a colleague who recently coined the term to me, skeptimist, and I, I love the term because I think that's really, you know, kind of what this project represents is that we're all skeptics. That is, you know, we're really not attached to the outcome, um, but we are optimistic about the promise of research. Mm -hmm. I just want to clarify because um, there are a group of people out there who wrap themselves in the flag of skepticism and give skepticism a bad name. <laughs> they use skepticism as an excuse for not uh, accepting anything uh, prima facie that they don't want to accept. Uh, whereas any, any scientist, any researcher, and any practitioner, you, you need to be skeptic skeptical of anything that you're you're trying especially here when we're venturing off into into new areas so 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 skepticism is healthy and i love that term to be we should all be skeptics yeah yeah i mean but listen i was a skeptic for about this for years and years and years i mean it took me seeing um, my students being able to have the same outcomes it took seeing sort of miracle after miracle after miracle in my practice and in our classes we see extraordinary transformation over and over and over again in our classes and something's going on it's happening and even if it's all the placebo effect even if it's all in our mind well you know what you don't have to get undressed for this nobody sticks you with needles you don't have to deal with the side effects of drugs you know you're not getting any bones cracked you just lie in there while people ding tuning forks over you and you feel better so in the grand scheme of what could be placebo effect this is a pretty good one and and it's and it's very consistent the outcomes are very consistent they're very predictable you know so it's it works in clinic the, the, the hypothesis has been tested and shown to be effective probably hundreds of thousands of times at this point mm -hmm. you know so we we know that it works in clinic we're not trying to prove clinical efficacy or anything like that we're just really curious about what's really going on and how can we define it how can we better understand it so that's you know and here's the thing about you know, us kind of calling out numbers and finding spots. The fact of the matter is, is that we exist in the space between each other. And different people that we encounter bring up different things in us. We resonate different parts of our being with different people. So even if somebody is lying blindfolded, their field is still responding to the field of the person who's coming in. So, you know, there could be, we could all come up with very different numbers, but that doesn't mean that this doesn't work. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, you know, there's just, there's many slippery aspects when you're dealing with mind in this very dynamic field.